Good evening, and welcome to Freedom Baptist Church in our midweek Bible study and prayer time. I'm so glad you chose to join us this evening. We're going to continue our study in the book of Psalms, and tonight we're going to be looking at Psalm 9. And Psalm 9 is another psalm attributed to King David. And the title is so uncertain that we're just not going to focus our attention there. In its entirety, this is a psalm of praise and prayer. Now, there is little agreement among the scholars as to how to divide up the psalm and and how to label the different parts, except it seems to divide readily into two parts. The first part is uh, praise for divine justice, and that's verses 1 through 12. The second part is prayer for divine justice, and that's 13 through 20. Now, in this psalm, David reminds us that God is indeed a just God and that we should praise him for his justice. But on the other hand, David also reminds us that although God is just, we should take part in seeking justice from God through prayer. Some people don't pray because they see no point in praying for something that's going to happen anyway. But that misses the point of prayer. Prayer is an act of dependence and confidence upon God. But it is also an expression of faith in God. You see, prayer changes things. God has ordained to work through the prayers of his people. And so God has chosen this. Jesus prayed and taught us to pray. He said that our Heavenly Father knows what we have need of even before we ask. And yet in the model prayer, he taught us to pray, Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus knew the will of the Father. Jesus submitted to the will of the Father. But he also prayed, and he prayed often. It was his custom to rise early and to spend time with the Father in prayer. So we too should praise God for his divine justice, and we should also cry out to God for the outworking of his divine justice. So as we get started this evening, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this psalm, for reminding us that you are a just judge, that you are righteous, that you always judge rightly. And yet, Lord, help us to be sober in how we approach life, Help us to be reminded that you see everything, that you're fully aware of every detail in our lives, in the lives of others, in the lives of our oppressors. And Lord, I pray that you will do a work of grace in each of our lives. Forgive us where we have failed you and help us to have confidence and assurance before the righteous judge. Lord, if there's anyone watching who has not trusted you as their personal Savior, I pray that today will be a day when they will turn from their sin and turn to the Savior. May you bless our study tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 9, and we're going to read... Initially, we'll read verses 1 through 12. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou Most High. When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou sattest in the throne, judging right. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them. 
but the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in time of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. So as we get started in this psalm this evening, first of all, David's praise is something which we should model. David has confidence in God's faithfulness and is, is grounded in remembering God's mighty deeds and his works. And this is something that we're encouraged to do. The children of Israel were to have the Passover meal every year so that they would be reminded of God's deliverance of his people. Verses 1 and 2 say, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to, uh, to thy name, O thou most high. So David is praising the Lord. And over and over, the children of Israel were reminded to reflect upon the great deeds of God, the great works of God, his deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt, the crossing of the Red Sea, the manna in the wilderness, and other miracles and signs that God did through Moses, the fall of Jericho. And uh, we, too, should be telling our children about the mighty works of God and reflecting upon God's greatness. God is worthy of our praise. In verses 3 and 4, David praises the judge himself. He says, When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou sattest in the throne, judging right. Now this is an important thing for us to, to reflect upon. Because there are two parallel phrases that David uses. At thy presence... And thou sattest in the throne judging right. We are always in God's presence. God sees all. God knows all. God always judges rightly. We may not see his judgment come to pass instantly. We may not see someone receive their just due right away. But we can be confident that ultimately God will judge rightly. In verses 5 through 8, David praises for just judgment. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy! Destructions are come to a perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in righteousness." Now, there's a contrast here, and what is contrasted is David brings out the temporary nature of the wicked, that God will bring to a close the ultimate heritage of the wicked. 
Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 says, As it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. You see, the judgment is a reality. But the temporary nature of the wicked is contrasted with the eternal existence and justice of Almighty God. And that eternal existence and justice has an impact in the next two verses upon those who are oppressed. In verses 9 through 10, he says, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed. The oppressed would be uh, those who were vulnerable and afflicted. And he says that God will be a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. So what a beautiful expression of God's faithfulness. Thou, Lord, will not forsake them that trust in thee and that seek and them that seek thee. The final two verses of this section break out in triumphant praise. David returns to praise just as he began with praise. He returns to praise. He says, Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. So here David is is breaking out in praise and he is inviting others to join him in that praise. Declare among the people his doings. We should be reminding one another of God's greatness, of God's great works, of God's great accomplishments, of his faithfulness in our lives and his historic faithfulness as revealed in the scriptures. In verse 12, it speaks of making inquisition for blood. This emphasizes the reality that God takes personal interest in the lives of individuals whose blood has been shed. When God was speaking to Cain after he had killed Abel, God said to him, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. You see, God cares about the shedding of innocent blood. And uh, those whose blood has been shed cries out to God for justice. And God will bring about right justice. In the second half of the psalm, David breaks out in prayer to the Lord for help. Now, he had a present need but he doesn't give us the details or the circumstances. But he does say something that is fascinating, something that is huge. Listen to what he says in verses 13 through 14. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death, that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. So why did David pray for deliverance? Why was David asking God to deliver him? Well, David doesn't tell the circumstances, but he does tell the purpose that I may show forth all thy praise. And he talks about rejoicing. This is huge. Why do you pray? What is it you seek when you cry out to God? When you cry out to God for justice? Do you seek deliverance for yourself? For your own comforts? For uh, justice so that you can be avenged? Or do you cry out to God to be delivered so that you can bring glory to God, so that you can praise Him before others? 
It's so easy for our lives to revolve around ourselves. But life should revolve around our God. And it should be focused upon the glory of God. In verses 15 and 16, we see that the wicked will be rewarded. It says, The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Higayon, Selah. So here, it, it's, this can have like two different ways that it's fulfilled. One is somebody could lay a trap for others trying to hurt them or destroy them and be caught in their own trap and destroyed by their own trap. The other way of looking at it is that they may set a trap for somebody else, and it may actually injure somebody else. But in the ultimate reality of things, God will judge. And by the very nature that they harmed others through their own trap, that they will be judged by that action. So whether they fall into their own trap in this life or whether their trap becomes a source for their ultimate judgment, both of those could be true and both of those could happen. And you see there will be future justice. Look at verses 17 and 18. He says, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. You see, God will deal justly with the wicked, both individuals and nations that forget God should heed these words they will face divine judgment. The context in which this is placed is in that of the needy and the poor. Jesus gave an illustration of the rich man and Lazarus. In this life, the rich man had everything that he could want, and Lazarus had nothing. But after death, the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell and was in torment while Lazarus was comforted in Abraham's bosom. Now, the point of this psalm and the point of Jesus' illustration is not to say that every rich man is uh, dastardly and wicked or that every poor man will be saved and delivered. The point of it is that the Lord will rightly reward those who face challenges in life and those who are even blessed in life. And what we receive in life is not necessarily indicative of what we deserve. That once we pass on, we may face very different circumstances than what we think in this life. So this is a, a sobering thought and a sobering warning. Paul says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So be careful. You can be a poor person and love money and have that as a source of evil. And you can be a wealthy person and the love of money can be all kinds of sources of evil. Finally, the psalm is concluded with a cry for God to rise up and show the nations that they are merely mortal. Listen to these words in verses 19 through 20. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. 
Selah. What a sobering warning. Now, every nation should realize that they are mortal. You know, the book of Daniel demonstrates that God is in charge of the nations. Nations are raised up and nations are brought down. And it's God who is in charge. We would do well to remember that in our own nation. Who would have thought just a few months ago that our nation would be so greatly impacted by a virus? We weren't expecting it. We weren't really prepared for it. And yet, the reality is, is a nation can raise up rather quickly, and a nation can come tumbling down through some uh, circumstances that are unexpected. And what we should do is humble ourselves before Almighty God and seek His deliverance, seek His forgiveness, seek His restoration. We need revival across our land. We need revival in our nation. So how can this psalm apply to you and to me today? First of all, we should join David in exalting and and in praising our magnificent God. He is indeed just, and he will judge rightly. This should capture our attention and instruct our hearts. God is always right in the way in which he judges. Secondly, we should be reminded of God's continual presence in our lives. Nothing is hidden from the Lord. He sees all, and his eyes go to and fro throughout the whole earth, beholding the evil and the good. Never forget that you are in God's presence. And ultimately, it is before Almighty God that you must stand and give an account, even if nobody else knows what you're doing or what's going on. We will stand in God's presence. Thirdly, God will judge the wicked rightly. He will also judge us rightly. But for the wicked, they will stand before him without an advocate. For the believer, we will have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, everyone will stand before the Lord, but the wicked will stand before the Lord and face ultimate judgment. The the believer, the one who places his hope and confidence in the Lord, who trusts in Jesus as their own personal Savior, when they stand before God, they will have Jesus as their advocate because he died upon the cross for our sins. If you have not trusted Christ as your Savior yet, then please don't wait another day. Trust him and he will save you now. Finally, God is a refuge for all those who trust in him. This too should be a great encouragement for us no matter what our circumstances. God is faithful. It does not mean that you will not face difficult circumstances in your life. What it does mean is that God will be faithful in and through those difficult times and he will take care of you. So I hope you've enjoyed our study this evening. And again, if you would like more information about what it means to trust in Jesus as your personal Savior, I encourage you, go to our website. There's a tab at the top, a drop-down tab that says, what we believe, and when it drops down, there's another uh, link to a page that describes God's good news of salvation. I encourage you, check that out. And if you trust in Christ as your personal Savior, please let us know. We would love to rejoice in that with you. Now, I have some prayer requests tonight. 
I'd like you to remember to continue to pray for Sandy Seton's sister, Cheryl. Cheryl is in a nursing facility, and she's tested positive for COVID-19. And others in that facility have tested positive. Fortunately, Cheryl is still asymptomatic. She doesn't show any symptoms. So pray that she will have a full recovery. But she's got other medical conditions, and pray for her about those other medical conditions. Pray for all of the nursing facilities. Our very own Maxine Olry is over at Autumn Care. Pray for Maxine. There are others within Autumn Care who have come down with it. And uh, I haven't gotten an update in the last couple of days, but please pray for that uh, nursing facility and others that you might be aware of. Pray for those who have been... Uh, quarantined or uh, sheltered and not able to see family, not able to see friends. Some people are extremely lonely. And pray for them. And also pray for those who are facing uncertainty because of their jobs or because of other circumstances in life. We know that God is fully aware of all of these things and yet there are challenges. There uh, are financial challenges. There are medical challenges. And pray for one another. I've got some unspoken prayer requests that uh, I can't share. But please pray for those unspoken. Sometimes they are even more pressing than the ones that we can share with others. And pray for our nation. Pray for our leaders. Our leaders need God's wisdom, and your church leaders need God's wisdom. And be patient. Uh, not everyone agrees with how things should open up and how things should unfold, but God's still on his throne, and pray that our leaders will have wisdom, and pray that God will help them to come to a, a good consensus as to what needs to be done and how quickly things should open up. And just pray for one another because we need to pray for one another. So let's have a word of prayer right now. Lord, I thank you for the hope that we can have through Jesus Christ. And Lord, I know that there are people in our church who are facing uncertainties. I know that people are facing medical conditions. I pray for Cheryl, and I pray for Maxine, and I pray for others who are facing very difficult circumstances. I pray for those who may be facing a job loss or a diminishing of income because of this situation. I also pray for those who have been uh, isolated from friends and family. I pray that you will encourage them, help them to remember your presence. Help them to remember that you have promised never to leave us or forsake us. Lord, I pray that our nation will recover from this, this virus. But Lord, even more importantly, I pray that our nation will have a revival. Lord, I pray that you will stir people's hearts, especially your own people, and help us to humble ourselves before you, to pray, to seek your face, and Lord, I pray for uh, salvation of other people, that they will come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. And Lord, we will thank you and we will praise you for it. Give our leaders wisdom. Give our president and the Congress, the Supreme Court, our state leaders, our community leaders. Lord, please give wisdom where wisdom is needed. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for joining us. May you have a wonderful, wonderful week.